Stanford University. So first, thanks very much for coming early and joining us for the debate. And thanks uh, to those of you especially who tried out the React Labs application. I hope to have some information from the organization to share with you within the next couple days. And I'd be happy to, happy to do that and also open up an <coughs> online discussion forum for that. As you also know, the focus of today's discussion is on the law, the judiciary, and the implications um, thereof for the, uh, from the election. Um, while we might make some passing references to the debate we just watched, that won't be the focus of our conversation. And we will also have an opportunity to have an online discussion about that separately um, for, for you to comment. The format will follow more or less this, what we've done in the past. Um, Jim will introduce our two guests from for this evening. Each will have about five minutes to make some opening remarks. And then it will be an open conversation on stage amongst the five of us. As before, we've taken some of the questions that you have posted online and voted up and down and woven those into our conversation. So please welcome Jim to make introductions. Right. Sounds good, Rob. So we have a real treat tonight. We have two of the really fine legal minds in the United States sitting between David Kennedy and myself on the stage. They are, uh, they are also two of the finest teachers you'll ever meet, even though their careers have now diverged a little because Pam's still teaching and Goodwin is a justice of the California Supreme Court. So Pam Carlin is the Kenneth and Harl Montgomery Professor of Public Interest Law at Stanford uh, Law School, and she runs the Supreme Court Litigation Clinic. Some of you guys who've taken the class that Pam and Rob and I taught last year and the, and the freshman version that Pam and Rob are teaching this year know that that means that Pam has gotten students here at Stanford, law students, to become an incredible force in, tr in terms of Supreme Court litigation in the United States. And that's because not only is she a great teacher, but she's an extraordinary litigator herself. When I first met Pam, she was a lawyer at the NACP Legal Defense Fund, where she was a pioneer in the field of voting rights. So you can be assured we're going to talk about voting rights tonight. Other stuff you need to know about Pam Carlin. Number one, she was the lawyer for Lily Ledbetter. So if anybody wants to know. <laughs> Pam, Pam, has rep Pam has represented so many people who, did, who needed representation. Lost. It's amazing. She's a, <laughs> although not me or Rob yet, yet. Anyway, she's an extraordinary teacher. She gets, all, she gets teaching awards at the law school. She is a brilliant litigator. She is a famed Supreme Court advocate. Her name always comes up when they're talking about who might be nominated for the United States Supreme Court. And best of all, in this, we're going to have a poll after the class. I believe she should host Saturday Night Live at some point. So after you watch her tonight, I want to know if we should all vote and write the folks at SNL to have Pam at least host one time. All right, Goodwin, <laughs> seated next to her, uh, is a great story, of Stan a great Stanford story, even though he did teach at UC Berkeley Law School for a period of time. Now, Goodwin is from, uh, was born in Augusta, Georgia, moved to Clewiston, Florida as a little boy, and then moved to Sacramento, California, where he did his high school. Goodwin came to Stanford. He is, he is a, an extraordinary story of, of, of success. Got a Rhodes Scholarship. He was a, I remember Goodwin as an undergraduate because he was a very important campus leader. He got a Rhodes Scholarship, two years at Oxford, then earned a master, where he earned a master's in philosophy. He got his law degree from Yale. Then he worked as an appellate litigator at O'Melveny & Myers, clerk for Judge David Tatel on the uh, District Court of Appeals. By the way, I forgot to mention that Pam clerked for Justice Harry Blackman, the author of Roe versus Wade. So you have two former Supreme Court law clerks up here. So Goodwin clerked first for Judge David Tatel on the DC Circuit, and then clerked for Ruth Bader Ginsburg, where, among other things, he contributed a draft to her dissent in Bush v. Gore. Um, he also served in the Department of Ed. Goodwin then went to UC Berkeley Law School, where he was a fabulously popular professor. Um, and, 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 and I'm sure this will come up, so I'll say it. He was then nominated to the Ninth Circuit by uh, President Obama. And his, and his nomination was repeatedly held up by the Republican Party and, 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 and not put to a vote uh, in the Senate. After being held up for a couple of years, Ju uh, Ju uh, Governor Jerry Brown appointed Goodwin to the California Supreme Court, whereas he, he is one of the seven justices of the California Supreme Court. Uh, little known fact about Goodwin is he is also one of the most d d doting fathers in the history of the world. He has two, <laughs> girl, two incredibly cute two and five year old kids, and his wife gave him a special hall pass to come here tonight to be part of our class. So, Goodwin, Pam, we are really like so glad to have you guys. Now, Pam, 
Pam goes first, Not or Goodwin. I think Goodwin's Goodwin. Goodwin gets to go right. first, then because Pam, and then, <clears throat> and then Justice Kennedy over here will we'll get to ask the question. <laughs> Well, thank you all very much. Uh, can, is my mic on? Can you hear me? OK, great. Um, it's a pleasure to be here. Pleasure <clears throat> always to be back at Stanford. Um, it's a pleasure, a special pleasure to be introduced by Jim Steyer, from whom I learned uh, my first dose of constitutional law in a class on civil rights and civil liberties that he taught when I was an undergraduate, if you could believe that, 25 more years ago. Um, so. <clears throat> And between Pam and me, I think you have sort of law professor most likely to host Saturday Night Live and law professor least likely to host Saturday Night Live. Um, most of the evening, I think, will be spent on discussion. So um, just to set the stage, I have a few opening remarks, and, and Pam does as well. Um, I want to give you guys a little bit of uh, context for the relationship between elections and at least the US Supreme Court, although we'll be talking about the judiciary as a whole. And, um, you know, this topic always comes up because at any given time when a presidential election is going on, uh, there are always some justices who appear to be uh, on the verge of retirement. Um, you know, those folks grow old in office because they have life tenure. Um, right now, Ruth Bader Ginsburg is 79 years old. Justice Scalia is uh, 76, as is Justice Kennedy. Um, Justice Breyer uh, is 74 years old. Um, none of them have said anything about retirement, but, you know, the speculation nonetheless continues. Um, and also, there are a lot of five to four decisions issued by the Supreme Court on a range of issues from campaign finance to affirmative action to abortion to the death penalty to congressional power, church and state, you name it. Uh, and so there's always a sort of perception that one vote, you know, one switch uh, of a vote could change the course of uh, legal history dramatically in this country. And so a lot of the conventional wisdom, conventional analysis, has tended to focus on scenarios where uh, a justice retires and is replaced by uh, a president of the opposing uh, party or opposing ideological persuasion. So people say, well, an interesting scenario is, you know, Governor Romney gets elected and Justice Ginsburg retires. Wow, that would be, you know, an opportunity for some kind of seismic shift in the law. Or if President Obama is reelected and say Justice Scalia retires, well, what a, you know, remarkable opportunity that would be for just uh, for President Obama. What I want to tell you, though, is that focusing on those kinds of scenarios is actually uh, looking at the sort of tail uh, of the bigger dog. Uh, because um, what I want to show you is, is here's the list of the last 11 appointments going all the way back 30 years to Sandra Day O'Connor. I just chose arbitrarily 30 years. There have been 11 appointments to the US Supreme Court during this time. And uh, as you look at this list, um, only one of them only one instance fits this model of an ideological 180-degree uh, shift. And that's, and that, oops, I'm sorry. That's this one. Clarence Thomas replacing Thurgood Marshall in 1991. It doesn't get much more polar opposite than that. <laughs> but that is really the exception, OK? There have been other instances of opposing party presidents replacing a justice. So I put asterisks, for instance, by Justice Stevens, Justice Souter, and Justice Blackmun, all of whom were appointed by Republican presidents, but turned out to be, in the context of the courts they served, fairly liberal justices, or centrist to liberal. Uh, and they were replaced by people who were roughly like them. So those don't sort of fit the, the conventional mold. There is one other uh, instance on this list where there was kind of an opportunity to seism seismically shift the court, and that's this one. Justice Brennan retired during the, second Bush, uh, se during the, uh, during the first Bush uh, presidency. And uh, S Justice Souter, David Souter at the time, uh, was promised to be uh, a diehard conservative, and we know how that story ended. And so that didn't end up being a very uh, significant event in terms of replacements at all. So what I want to tell you that is that the changes that have happened in the court over the last, say, 30 years have happened in far more incremental and subtle and nuanced ways. Let me highlight for you three changes on this list that have had quite significant repercussions, though they don't fit the kind of conventional interesting scenario. One of them is right here. In 1986, President Reagan elevated then Justice uh, William Rehnquist to be Chief Justice when uh, Chief Justice Warren Burger retired. And then to fill the space that Rehnquist vacated, he appointed Antonin Scalia 
to that seed. Okay, two big things happened there. Rehnquist uh, turned out to be a fairly strong leader of the US Supreme Court, unlike his predecessor, Warren Berger. Rehnquist, uh, among his accomplishments, uh, succeeded in persuading Congress to eliminate much of the mandatory jurisdiction of the US Supreme Court, which enabled the court then to control its docket quite significantly much more. And what you now observe as the declining docket of the US Supreme Court is largely due to this phenomenon. Pre-1988, when that change occurred due to Rehnquist's efforts, uh, the court was hearing over 120 cases a year. And now it's hearing less than 80. What about Scalia's appointment? Well, I don't think there's necessarily a lot of difference in votes, perhaps, between Scalia and Berger. There may be a few. But the bigger story there is that Justice Scalia is known to be an intellectual anchor of the conservative uh, legal wing. And he brings to the court a kind of vitality and intellectual leadership uh, that many people think quite important. Here's another one. Justice Ginsburg replaced Justice White. Justice White was appointed by uh, President Kennedy, uh, so a Democrat for a Democrat, but there are some big differences. Justice White was uh, one of the most vocal opponents of Roe versus Wade, called it a raw exercise of judicial power. Uh, he was also very conservative um, on all matters of substantive due process doctrine. He dissented in Miranda versus Arizona. Um, he was kind of like Justice Ginsburg on other issues, uh, gender discrimination, school desegregation. Uh, but there, there are important differences uh, between those two justices, and this was an important change. And lastly, I'll just end with this one, Justice Alito replacing Justice O'Connor. Across several uh, issues, from campaign finance to the death penalty to uh, abortion to um, <clears throat> uh, school desegregation, the use of race uh, by government, uh, Justice Alito has shown himself to be uh, more conservative than Justice O'Connor was on these issues. So when we look at the sum total of, of uh, these kinds of appointments, what I want you to focus on is that every change on the US Supreme Court makes a difference. Everyone. Every time a new person is put on, it's a new court. And if you begin with the premise, which many people do in conventional political wisdom, that a person like Ruth Bader Ginsburg or a person like Antonin Scalia could not get confirmed in the current confirmation process, then already you have made a concession to the important dynamic of change, uh, regardless of who the appointing president's party might be. Uh, that has occurred over the last uh, 30 years or so. Oh, leave the, leave the slide up. No, leave the slide up, because I think I want to pick up uh, a little bit where uh, Goodwin left off. Um, so it's a uh, delight to be here with you tonight. Many of you have heard the cliche that comes from a famous but apocryphal bartender who was asked, uh, about the Supreme Court and its relationship to having the Constitution apply overseas in a, in a famous uh, passage of uh, something called Mr. Dooley's Opinions. And uh, Mr. Dooley, the bartender, says, well, geez, I don't know if the flag follows, the, the Constitution follows the flag. That is, when we go overseas, do constitutional rights go over there? An issue of some importance today, uh, as it was at the turn of the last century, he said, but I'll tell you, even if the Constitution doesn't follow the flag, one thing I'll tell you is the Supreme Court follows the election returns. Uh, and people often think what that means is the Supreme Court looks at what's popular uh, and then decides uh, to do whatever they think uh, will make them popular. That, I think, is inaccurate. But I think in another sense, and Goodwin started us off on this, the Supreme Court does follow the election returns because who gets elected determines who's going to be on the Supreme Court. And as Goodwin points out, uh, being a Supreme Court justice is a little bit like being an orchestra conductor. You live forever once you get the job. And so, for example, uh, Justice, uh, Chief Justice Rehnquist served until uh, the early part of this century, having been appointed by Richard Nixon in 1973. John Paul Stevens was appointed by President Ford in 1975. The last federal district judge appointed by John F. Kennedy only died two years ago. So one of a president's lasting legacies is the people he, or I hope one day she, puts on the bench. Uh, 
And here is a point that I think it's really important to understand, which is there has been a fundamental change in American politics over the last 30 years that is going to end up affecting the Supreme Court. And that fundamental change is the rise of two ideologically distinct political parties in the United States. Until recently, the two parties overlapped. So the Democratic Party as a whole was to the left of the Republican Party, but there were liberal Republicans and there were quite conservative Democrats. In the last Congress, that ideological overlap has disappeared entirely. The most conservative Democrats are now more liberal than the most liberal Republicans. And what does that mean? It means that although Justices Stevens, Souter, and O'Connor were Republican appointees. They are Republican appointees from a different Republican party than the Republican party we have today. Two of them are Northern Republicans of a kind that just do not exist anymore. Think about the recent death of Arlen Specter, who was one of those people and then became a Democrat. Right? So there is a fundamental change in how the two parties think about legal issues as well. And it's important to understand here two other points that I want to highlight that I'm sure we'll get into more in the discussion. The first of these is this is not just about high ticket constitutional law issues. It's not just about Roe against Wade or about the constitutionality of campaign finance law. It's also about how everyday legislation gets enforced in very everyday cases. Lily Ledbetter's case was not a constitutional case. It was a case about a congressional statute and what that statute meant. Cases about the rights of workers for overtime or about the Clean Water Act or about uh, the Employment, Retirement, and Income Security Act, which protects pensions and workers' benefits and like. Most of those don't raise constitutional issues at all. They're simply about applying statutes to the facts of particular cases. And different judges are going to view those cases very differently. So it's not just about four or five, five to four issues. It's about, uh, it's about hundreds of issues that never get to the Supreme Court, which is my second point. There are several hundred federal judges. Only nine of them sit on the Supreme Court. Most people's cases never get to the Supreme Court. Their cases are going to be decided by judges who are district judges or court of appeals judges. And here, the two parties, I think, have very different philosophies about how to go about making these appointments. I think it's safe to say that the Republican Party has been much more organized about these issues and much more self-consciously trying to move the law than the Democratic Party has. Uh, and that has had major effects. So that one thing that um, Goodwin didn't say about this list, but I think it's fair with the possible exception of Justice Ginsburg for Justice White, every one of these people on this list is more conservative than the person they replaced. Every one of them. And that's true also if you look at the lower federal courts. The most liberal judges on the lower federal courts right now are the two or three Lyndon Johnson nominees who are still uh, serving. And then the Jimmy Carter nominees. They are more liberal than the Bill Clinton nominees. And the Bill Clinton nominees as a group, I think, are more liberal than the Barack Obama nominees and confirmations. Uh, so the two parties have moved in different directions on this issue. That is, the Democrats have moved towards the center and the Republicans have moved toward the right. Uh, and again here, one of a president's greatest legacies is the judges that he or she leaves behind who will enforce the laws that the president gets uh, enacted by Congress during uh, a limited term of office. So I'll stop there and we can get into the discussion. Okay. Well, thanks to you both. Uh, I want to suggest a little bit of structure or attempted structure for this discussion. Uh, that we begin by discussing some of the ways that things ha that have happened in the judicial realm uh, have affected the current political climate and especially the course of this electoral campaign. And then inevitably, I'm sure we'll get into some of the things that are at stake going forward in this campaign. We've already touched on some of that already. So let me go immediately to the most proximate uh, judicial decision that seems to many people's minds to have had the most massive influence on this campaign to distinguish it. Uh, 
from prior campaigns, and that is, of course, Citizens United. Um, Pam, I know you've written about this and have some strong views on it, so maybe I'll address the question to you first, but Goodwin, I hope you'll weigh in as well. But I think it would be helpful for this uh, group here this evening if you could just explicate briefly the grounds on which the decision was made, and I'm sure you'll have opinions about the, the uh, soundness of those grounds. Um, and in particular, I hope you can address the, the comment that I've heard made frequently that Citizens United is in fact good constitutional law, but bad policy. Sure, so uh, the issue in Citizens United was whether corporations and unions can spend general treasury money, that is money <laughs> they raise in the normal course of their businesses, uh, to try and influence uh, elections by um, buying ads or handling get out the vote efforts or the like. Uh, there was a federal law at the time, uh, part of the Bipartisan Campaign Reform Act, the McCain-Feingold Law, that said that corporations and unions could not engage in what was called independent electioneering expenditures. That is, spending money, not giving the money to candidates or to parties, but spending the money themselves to influence the outcome of elections by running ads that mentioned identifiable candidates for office within a certain period of time before the election. Uh, and the Supreme Court, for a long time, since the 1970s, has held that the First Amendment, which prohibits Congress from abridging freedom of speech, prohibits uh, the regulation of expenditures. You can regulate people's contributions to candidates, but you can't generally regulate what they spend their own money on to talk. Uh, and that had been uh, true generally except with respect to corporations and unions, which were told they could only spend money that they raised separately for the purposes of spending it on elections. That's where so-called PACs came in, is they would set up a PAC and you could give money to, to it. But for example, a corporation couldn't just take the money that it was making uh, by selling widgets uh, and use that money directly uh, to try and influence federal elections. And in Citizens United, the Supreme Court held five to four that the identity of a speaker doesn't matter to the prohibition on infringing freedom of, of speech. And therefore, corporations and unions could spend their own money uh, to try and influence elections uh, directly. So that's what the case held. I mean, that's, that's basically what the case held. Um, I think for a lot of people, they focus too much on Citizens United rather than the entire panoply of Supreme Court decisions about uh, campaign finance, because Citizens United was not a huge shift in the law. It was an expansion, but it wasn't a huge shift. And much of the money that's flowed into the uh, political process over the last uh, several years since Citizens United has not been general corporate spending by big business. It's been huge amounts of spending by super wealthy individuals uh, giving the money to so-called super PACs. Um, which, uh, or, or to 527 organizations and now 524 organizations. Uh, and the problem here is it's huge amounts of money and oftentimes it's untraceable, at least in the short run, so nobody knows where the money is coming from. Um, the last part of your question is it's good constitutional law but bad policy. I think it was bad constitutional law to hold that all corporations can spend as much money as they want in elections, or indeed that all people can spend as much money as they want in elections, because I think there's actually a bit of a trade-off between several different values in our political system. One of them is freedom of speech, and another one, which you heard a little bit about in the debate tonight, is leveling the playing field. Uh, and uh, the problem is that if some voices can spend lots more money they can drown out other voices in the process, and they can make it harder for other groups to compete. Uh, since the 1960s, we've had a principle in the United States of one person, one vote, because we believe in political equality. And yet, when it comes to campaign finance, uh, the Supreme Court seems very hostile to the idea of anything that's designed to level the playing field, and I think that's bad constitutional law. On the other hand, I think, saying that corporations should have no right to participate in the political process is also bad constitutional law, or that corporations have no free speech rights. And you saw, I think, a lot of this when people got very angry and said the problem is the Supreme Court has held that corporations are people. 
Um, because of course corporations should have a right to speak in the process. Newspapers are corporations. Ideological groups ranging from the NRA on the right to, uh, you know, to NARAL on the left are corporations. Um, so I don't think it's so much corporations versus individuals as it is vast aggregations of wealth uh, that change fundamentally how political debate and political campaigning occur. But isn't it the case that the constitutional obstacle to uh, doing business differently is that troublesome old poo, the First Amendment, which is pretty absolutist in its language. Well, it's, it's, in one sense it's absolutist in language, but no one, and I mean no one, takes the language absolutely, because the absolute language is Congress shall make no law abridging freedom of speech. We have laws that say you can't say your money or your life, right, that's extortion. We have laws that say, I can't say, buy this drug, it will cure cancer. That's the Food and Drug Act. We have laws that say, I can't say, you know, uh, David Kennedy was convicted of 15 counts of stock fraud. That's libel. All of those are laws that abridge freedom of speech. Unless it's true. Yeah, well, then, <laughs> yeah. well, truth is always a good defense. Um, but nobody, nobody thinks that that means there can't be any regulations. Disclosure laws that say you have to say who's paying for the ad. But isn't it also speech. the case that there's, there's a special tradition of, of treating political speech differently than other forms of speech? Yeah, but there's also a special tradition of regulating corporations in a way that we don't regulate individuals and regulating live people. So, for example, if you work for the federal government, the Hatch Act says you can't engage in partisan political activity, right? It treats some people differently than others. So I don't think, I, I, I don't think there's any absolute rule that says all people have to be treated exactly the same or all entities or all speakers. Goodwin, you want to weigh in on this? Well, I just had a couple comments. I, I'll be a little careful here because as a, as a lower court, uh, when it comes to federal issues, I, I don't want to, um, as, as, someone, as some judges say, you know, grade the, grade the people who grade my papers. Um, <laughs> so, um, but just to amplify what Pam said, um, I think it's a little too blunt to say the objection to Citizens United is that um, the court has treated corporations as people. Um, I think if you, if you actually read the opinion, which is quite lengthy, uh, I wouldn't um, assume that all of you have read it, um, the, uh, the, the, the majority opinion goes on at some length to, to say that, you know, look, um, the corporate form uh, subsumes lots of different kinds of organizations, most traditionally um, the media. Uh, and so, although the campaign finance law at issue exempted the media from these uh, types of restrictions, the theory, right, of the First Amendment that recognizes the right of corporations to speak, in a sense, uh, certainly is one that uh, would recognize the right of media corporations to speak. Um, and so, we have to, if you're going to object to Citizens United, it can't be through the simple kind of uh, mindset simply that corporations are not people. Let me make one other point, which I think goes to a couple observations. One is that it is an empirical, it is a matter of some empirical debate whether or not corporations, per se, are the problem in terms of uh, big money and politics as opposed to individuals. But that just goes to the point that maybe what we care about is the shape of the distribution uh, of money going into politics and not the aggregate amount. So Sam Zakharoff, another law professor, has written a little bit about this to say that you know, um, President Obama uh, in 2008 broke all records for the amount of money he introduced into uh, presidential politics. He raised a quarter, three quarters billion dollars, $750 million spent on that single campaign. But he also broke uh, all records for the number of people he got uh, to give money. So a quarter of his uh, donors were small money donors. And so the net of that, I think many people uh, would say, was that was a good thing, that he, uh, through fundraising, brought many more people into the participatory process. And so the shape of that distribution uh, is something that many people regard as, as uh, praiseworthy. Uh, and uh, it's not the mere fact of there being a lot of money in politics. Can I get into this? I want to follow up on one of the things you, you said, Pam, about how uh, we shouldn't focus so much just on Citizens United, but the, the full panoply of, of, of court cases on campaign finance. 
And one thing, at least, that, to the best of my understanding, is genuinely different about the current cycle of campaign finance in the wake of Citizens United is the ways in which nonprofit organizations, these, these super PACs, or 501c4 social advocacy organizations, are the recipients of money, often from wealthy individuals, but as, as well, at least legally possible, from corp other corporate forms. And that money, as you mentioned, is not transparent. We don't know who gave that money. And that now forms a much, much larger percentage of campaign finance dollars than it has in the past in the wake of Citizens United. So you mentioned the lack of transparency, the lack of ability to trace the source of the money. It, what's, the, what's the constitutional doctrine say about the role of transparency within campaign finance? And is that something that's broken in the current system now? So the general rule has been, um, since the Supreme Court's kind of foundational decision in Buckley against Vallejo, which was in 1976, the general rule has been that disclosure requirements, and certainly disclosure requirements for any uh, sizable amount, most, for example, I think the federal disclosure requirements go down to $250, um, and a lot of states are at around the same level, are constitutional. Uh, eight members of the Supreme Court in Citizens United upheld the disclosure requirements there. One justice, Justice Thomas, thinks even the disclosure requirements are unconstitutional. What you're now seeing is an attack on disclosure requirements, a kind of sustained attack in the lower courts, people bringing challenges to disclosure requirements as well. So I think that's the ne next battleground. In Citizens United itself, Justice Kennedy's view was disclosure requirements solve all the problems because if people know where the money is coming from, uh, they can make an assessment both of how likely is it that the candidate will be influenced by that money, and also, most importantly, what does the fact that lots of people with lots of money are giving it to this particular candidate, or that particular industry groups are giving money to a particular candidate, tell us about what informed people are betting their money on, which horse are people with some information betting on, and so it can be very useful to know. Um, so the current law on disclosure is pretty good uh, in the sense that Congress and the state legislatures have the power to require disclosure. What's broken in the present system is that there are entities that are not under current law required to disclose, and Citizens United allows money that to be sent to those organizations and then spent. So one of the things uh, in another article that Sam Asakaroff uh, wrote, I actually co-wrote it with him. It's an article called The Hydraulics of Campaign Finance Reform. It basically says the following. Money is like water. If you dam it up over here, it will flow somewhere else. And what we constantly are doing is trying to chase the money and channel it. And that process over the last 40 years um, has not succeeded. It has not succeeded in making politics uh, better. Um, and the money has flowed into, in some ways, more and more pernicious forms. I want to do one more follow-up on this to, to tie into some of the broader discussions that, that you guys are leaning to, which is if you look at some of the, the, the political decisions, <coughs> they're uh, like Citizens United or Bush v. Gore. They're five to four decisions, and they appear to the average observer. We got this in some of the questions from, 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 the, from the audience. They appear to be sort of nakedly political. Mike, because of the way that they always break down, they're so predictable the way they break down, both Citizens United, Bush v. Gore. How much do you think that's a factor in this one? Going to where you were talking, actually when you and Goodwin did the, your, your uh, chart of the justices, versus a, phil a, a more genuinely legal philosophical difference. Well, now that I'm on the other side of this, uh, of, the, uh, yeah. of the bench, as it were, um, I, um, I can tell you uh, through first, sort of a little more firsthand perspective, um, you know, you, in order to make assessments like that, you really have to just, you have to read the opinions yourselves. It's not possible to make any broad sweeping statements about decisions simply on the basis of the vote. And let me say that, you know, five to four decisions from the US Supreme Court come uh, in all different kinds of configurations, not just the usual five to four that, that you're used to seeing. Um, and so I think you have to judge each case, case by case, and figure out, I mean, you can read Citizens United for yourself. Um, it will take you a day to get through it. 
but you can read it for yourself, and you can be the judge of whether or not yeah. this is um, a legal, to you know, right. just in conventional sense, legal opinion. Um, there's a lot to get through. Um, these people are, you know, extremely smart. They're extremely trained in the law, and they're, as far as I can tell, using um, an entire broad range of legal arguments. Now, it, it's hard to kind of look at that in my, in, from my point of view and say, oh, that's just politics. I, 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 if, if I could just add something here, I think it's important to understand, I think there are actually three buckets. There's technical law stuff of the kind that most reasonable people trained in the law would agree on. That is, how do you parse this particular statute um, you know, do you read uh, do you read these particular words in a special way or the like? Then there's pure partisan politics, and that's at the other end. And then there's something in the middle that I think is ideology. And I think the justices have deep ideological divisions that affect how they look at deep deep differences in their worldviews that affect how they look at issues where, to my mind, the law runs out. That is. How do you decide the balance between equality and leveling the playing field, which is an American value in politics on the one hand, and liberty and the right to spend your money the way you want and to speak as freely as you want, which is also a fundamental American value? Those two things have to be balanced. Different people will strike that balance in different ways, and that results in a divided Supreme Court. And those divisions right now sometimes map on to the political parties. But I don't think it's any justices sitting up there thinking, will this be good for the Democratic Party? Will this be bad for the Republican Party? That's how I decide what I do. But you see this in other areas of regulation of the political process. If I can just mention one that's of a lot of salience today, which is, do you think the bigger risk to the integrity of the election process is fraud, that is, people pretending to be people they aren't and voting, or people uh, registering people who aren't qualified to vote? Or do you think the bigger uh, threat to the integrity of the political process is vote suppression? That is, people who ought to be allowed to vote and are prevented from voting. The American people are deeply divided on this issue. And most people think, I don't actually agree with this, think there's a trade-off between the two things. That is, if you don't have very stringent requirements, you'll have lots more fraud, so you need the stringent requirements to keep the fraud down. Or uh, if you have any requirements at, at all, you're going to suppress huge numbers of votes, therefore there should be no uh, attempt to regulate absentee ballots or no attempt to regulate registration practices or the like. But that, there, people just have a fundamental difference in worldview about which of these two things is the greater threat. And it's very hard to get through to people empirically on this. That is, you know, it's very hard to get people to look at actual data or to decide what the data, what the data mean. Um, and no surprise, the Supreme Court justices tend to have the worldviews of the people who nominated them. Um, but I don't think it's either side thinks this will help the Republican Party or this will help the Democratic Party in a kind of, con in, in a kind of conscious way. You want to add something to that? Uh, I want to pick up on what you, <clears throat> you mentioned ideology. <clears throat> I want to follow up on that just a little bit. Uh, we have an opportunity here with two outstanding constitutional law professors to educate this audience about some terminology. You both used it when you were talking about the judicial appointments, Supreme Court appointments when we started out. You use the words liberal and conservative. We all have a rough and ready understanding of what those words mean in general life and general political discourse. But I believe they have a particular meaning when we talk about the judiciary. And I wonder if we could just take the opportunity to elucidate that a bit for each of you. Uh, give us your definition of what liberal and conservative means when it comes to the judiciary. I didn't have <laughs> stumped. You go stumped, first. Stumped me there. <laughs> well, I don't think the words mean in the judicial context exactly what they mean in general political discourse. Pam? If you're talking about individual rights, it depends on which individual rights. So uh, Ruth Bader Ginsburg is very strong on uh, reproductive rights for women. Uh, Samuel Alito is very strong on gun rights for gun owners. 
uh, those are two different sets of individual rights. I mean, there are, obviously they overlap. There are plenty of women, you know, protecting their reproductive rights by shooting people. But, um, <laughs> <laughs> but I, you know, I, 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 I think, you know, property rights are individual rights, and sometimes conservatives tend to be more protective of certain kinds of property rights than liberals are. So hard to say there. On federal power, uh, you get uh, what are, you know, blue state rights and red states' rights. So uh, the conservatives tend to want to protect the states when the states get sued for violating federal laws like uh, Title, Title VII or uh, the Family Medical Leave Act. Uh, the liberals tend to protect, protect states' rights to, for example, have their own tort systems that hold tort feasors liable. Uh, and uh, the conservatives often in those cases will say, well, I think that the states regulation of this area should be preempted by federal law. Or ask yourself, uh, who are the conservatives and who are the liberals on federal power versus states' rights when it comes to DOMA, the Defense of Marriage Act, right? Conservatives say the federal government should regulate what marriage means, and liberals are saying, to some extent, states should regulate it, and the federal government should respect the decisions of many states to allow same-sex couples to get married. Um, so I, I don't think it's so much that there's a cons I, I think really in the judiciary, when people talk about conservative and liberal, they're talking about it in, in the everyday sense of the word. Well, what, let me just pressure that. I'm, I'm surprised neither of you use the terms judicial restraint <coughs> or judicial activism. Because I don't think those map onto liberal and conservative. That not in the way you've been discussing it, which I'm trying to get yeah. you to do the remapping. It yeah. seems to me a judicial restraint it means that you, you defer to the legislature, and that doesn't have any ideological flavor in the usual way we discuss it, but it, it signifies all Wendell Holmes Jr. would have said that's the mark of judicial liberalism. It, but, but there's nobody out there who, well, there's one, maybe one <coughs> or two judges out there who say, I believe in judicial activism and I practice it regularly. Um, no, judicial activism is another way of saying people who strike down laws that I like, those are judicial activists. <laughs> judicial restraint is people who don't strike down laws that I think are a good idea. It's the same thing, I, you know, judicial restraint doesn't, nobody is a pure judicial restraint person right now, or very few people, certainly nobody on the Supreme Court. The most judicially restrained justice on the Supreme Court over the last 10 years with respect to, say, federal statutes is Justice Breyer, who I don't think anybody in the kind of popular mind thinks of as Mr. Judicial Restraint, but that's because he thinks Congress should have the power to pretty much regulate uh, what it wants. Um, so I think judicial activism and judicial restraint are kind of buzz terms used either to defend or attack uh, justices because you agree with or disagree with their policy preferences. Let me ask a, a quick follow-up and tie it into the Citizens United thing. Because one, one of the questions from the audience that got asked several times is, do you think there's any chance if there's a new uh, composition on the court that they would overturn Citizens United, an act of judicial act, that they would literally just, you know, five years later overturn it or three years later overturn it? Any chance? I don't think there's a I don't think there's a high chance that they would simply overturn Citizens United. What tends to happen, I mean, occasionally the Supreme Court just outright overturns a previous case and says it was wrong. So, for example, in Lawrence against Texas, uh, Justice Kennedy wrote an opinion for the court that said Bowers against Hardwick, which had criminalized uh, adult consensual uh, homosexual activity, was wrong when it was decided and it's overruled. But you don't see a huge number of cases like that. What you often see is what I think of as underruling or circumruling the cases. So you distinguish the law in front of you in the new case from the law in the old case by saying, well, it's true that the court said that you know horses should not run more than 10 miles an hour. But they did that in the context of a case where the horse was a bay. And this horse is a pinto. <laughs> <laughs> You know, so that they distinguish away the prior precedent or they nibble it down to a doorstop yeah. rather than coming right outright and saying it was wrong and, uh, you know, it's just plain overruled. Let's look backward for a second instead of for forward. Okay. Uh, a bunch of the students uh, were interested in getting your take on what the most significant court decision of their generation has been.
And then since there's also folks in the well, room. Well, you've got students here from like 18 to 90. So <laughs> right. which one asks? True. Let's, so let's take both. So let's just take the, the, the undergraduate student generation, say um, almost all of whom were born after 1990. And then extrapolating to the community population, the, the, the broader population in the room that go, let's just call it from the beginning, beginning of the 20th century. <laughs> <laughs> very, very generous. Please language. stand if you were born in the 19th century. <laughs> if you can. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so what Start with the post-1990. OK, most significant. Most significant. Well, I'll, I'll take a crack at that. I mean, I think there's a number of ways to answer that question. But one thing I'll say is that um, I, think, I think there is uh, something of significance um, for which the, uh, the health care decision this past year is kind of like a, a canary in the mine for. It's hard to call that a canary, because it's like, you know, if that's not Big Bird, who know, you know, what is Big Bird, right? So, um, <laughs> but the, uh, the, the, um, the court, largely through the leadership of Chief Justice Rehnquist and quite notably Justice O'Connor, I would, I would think of those two individuals as the two people who perhaps were most consistent in their commitment to federalism, meaning their commitment to states' rights. Um, I, th I do think it's, it's a, a significant development that through a series of cases, um, the court has reinvigorated the notion of judicial um, policing of the boundaries of federal power. Now, in most of those cases, um, the actual bite of the decisions has not been very great. I mean, the, 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 you know, the one that's often talked about was the first one in uh, uh, 1995, in which the court held unconstitutional the Gun-Free School Zone Act, which, you know, which were, um, prohibits a gun possession within 1,000 feet of a school. And people thought, well, you know, that's, you know, that's just a, that was a piece of populist legislation, not mu very much impact. Um, and you could fix that problem through uh, re legislative redrafting. But the more important point, I think, about these decisions, and, and even the health care case, some people say, well, the Congress, you know, that, that part of, the, of, of what the court said, it's not like there's a whole bunch of individual mandates out there in other pieces of federal legislation waiting to be struck down. The more important uh, in, uh, aspect, I think, of those decisions is the way in which those legal arguments um, get filtered and reinterpreted in the political debate. So I think it's not at all an accident that in the course of time in which we've seen these decisions, we've also seen the Tea Party, right? Um, the whole notion of government having overgrown and there needs to be paring back and there's got to be limits, it's part of an overall, um, I think, movement and intuition, which is a historical reaction, I think, to first the New Deal, then the Civil Rights Movement, those periods of dramatic expansion in American history, recent American history, in which the uh, presence of government has been enlarged. And you can just think about that, you know, I'll leave it to David Kennedy, who's, you know, uh, a, a better authority on this than I am, to think about these as, you know, part of the pendulum swings that happen in, in, uh, in the American experience. Because, yes, we do have a federal government, but we, we also have states. You know, we have a constitution that is premised on this federal system. And of course, there's going to be these swings back and forth. And so I think what we've experienced in this loosely called generation's um, experience is uh, a judicial noticing of that, uh, of that concept that differs quite dramatically than the prior two important epochs of American history uh, with respect to that particular issue. So I would say the most important case of the sort of undergraduate generation's time on Earth, uh, in terms of its impact, is Bush v. Gore. And the reason for that is not because it set out any legal principle that applies to any other case. Uh, it's a case that never gets cited for anything, even when it's relevant. Uh, and the Supreme Court said in its opinion there, don't try this at home, folks. But because uh, the world that we live in today was so powerfully affected by who the president was on 9-11 uh, and who the president was who replaced uh, Justice O'Connor and Chief Justice Rehnquist when they stepped down from the court. And that was a product of Bush v. Gore. So in terms of not its effect on the law in a narrow sense, but its effect on the law in a big sense, that was probably the most important case of the, of, 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 in the lifetime of the youngest generation in the room. 
In terms of my generation in the room, um, and I was born in 1959. Um, I just look like a child, I like to think. <laughs> um, the most important Supreme Court cases were a pair of cases that were decided by the Supreme Court in the mid-1960s. And the pair of cases were a case called South Carolina against Katzenbach uh, and a case called Katzenbach uh, against McClung, which was paired with another case called Heart of Atlanta Motel against the United States. And the reason these were the most important cases are these are the cases in which the Supreme Court didn't strike down a statute. It did something even more important, which is it upheld the two fundamental statutes of the Second Reconstruction, the Civil Rights Act of 1964, which has been the model for all anti-discrimination statutes since then, and the Voting Rights Act of 1965. And these two statutes did more than any opinions of the Supreme Court standing alone to create the equal world in which we now live. More African Americans were enfranchised under the administrative provisions of the Voting Rights Act of 1965 in the two years after it was passed than in the previous 100 years of litigation under the 15th Amendment to the Constitution. Uh, more school children had started to attend desegregated schools because of Title VI of the Civil Rights Act of 1964 than all the cases that had been brought to desegregate the schools up till then because the federal government said, we're going to cut off the funds to southern schools that don't start desegregating their school systems. And one of the parts of the uh, Affordable Care Act case that Goodwin mentioned but didn't get into is the court now seems in poised to limit Congress's spending power in ways that may be very important. Then, for the generation of people who are older than me in the room, probably the most important case is Brown against Board of Education uh, for two reasons. One is because it expressed America's fundamental commitment to equality and its recognition of the key role of public schools in providing that equality. And second, because it is the case that gives the current Supreme Court the moral capital that allows it to decide controversial issues. Uh, if you go back to the 19th century, people did not really respect the Supreme Court. The Supreme Court was in very bad odor uh, because of its decision in the Dred Scott case. Um, if you go back further than that, there are famous uh, cases of the government just defying the Supreme Court or ignoring what it did. But the Supreme Court has so much moral capital built up for, from Brown against Board of Education that that's why Al Gore was prepared to say when the Supreme Court announced no more vote counting, uh, OK, I'm going home. That wouldn't have happened in 1876 if the Supreme Court had announced in that election. And it certainly wouldn't have happened in 1800 if the Supreme Court had tried it then. And that's due to Brown against Board. You know, an interesting, I want to jump in here with an interesting footnote to that last comment, which is that it also wouldn't have happened if the Supreme Court had issued Bush v. Gore in 1955 or 1960 either. Yeah. So the iconic status of Brown versus the Board of Education is actually something that occurred through the generation that that happened after Brown, that, that lived after Brown. So, you know, it's important to know that when Brown was decided, you know, the, the, uh, the, the billboards in, in the South read impeach Earl Warren, right? Uh, it wasn't, and, and there was no school desegregation that happened as a result of Brown for at least 10 years until the legislative accomplishments that Pam just mentioned, until the federal government through legislation and regulation put some muscle behind it. And so it's interesting the way the capital of the Supreme Court has actually traveled. It's been a bit of, you might call it, revisionist history because uh, the power of Brown is not something that was immediately embraced, uh, even though there, were, there are data that show that a majority of the United States was prepared to accept uh, the principle in Brown, it was not uh, the revered, iconic decision that it now is until quite a significant time later. So let me ask a follow. I want to ask a follow up, and, and it's going to go to. There's a second piece of it that relates to questions that we got a bunch from the students. The first is, do you start? Have you? There's been a lot of, or a number of polls recently showing the Supreme Court has gone down in the public's opinion. And and a, do you think that, that that's a real trend and a troubling trend? The second, we got a, a number of questions about should there be term limits for Supreme Court justices, which may be motivated in the case of some of the guys writing the questions by the fact that. The Supreme Court has gone down in their estimation. They want some turnover on the court. So first question, do you think the, the court over the last decade has gone down in the public's estimation, maybe lost a little bit more capital? And then second, what do you think about term limits for Supreme Court justices? 
You want to describe it? And good when you don't have to answer. If there's any <laughs> point that you don't want to answer, you, you don't have to. you want to describe in a little detail that proposal? I don't know if it's Jeff Stone or who would. Yeah, there the, are a ton of those. This, this, is, this is the, 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 the question that actually came from the audience on term limits is, <clears throat> I've heard many arguments in favor of a term limits for Supreme Court justices. One proposal is staggered 18-year limit, so every president is guaranteed two appointments. This seems like a more fair system than the current one. It might also encourage the appointment of younger justices. What are your thoughts on this debate? And, and it, my, my thought on that debate is it ain't happening. <laughs> um, because, you know, uh, although there may be, you know, clever lawyers who can figure out ways around this, um, it would probably, in the end, require a constitutional amendment. Right. And uh, because the Constitution guarantees life tenure to federal judges, um, you would be changing that in some way. Yeah. Um, and, you know, uh, the reason we have life tenure for judges is, uh, is a simple one, so that they would be independent from the political branches. And by and large, I think that that um, has served us very well. Um, as to, uh, what was the other part of your question? The first part was actually more about, do you think that, that over oh, in, the, the, in, the, in, the, in the last 10 years there's been a diminution in some ways of, of the respect for the court? You know, I don't know. Um, I mean, there are, there are empirical people who have studied public opinion in the Supreme Court much, uh, much more carefully than I, than I have. But I will say this. I do think that um, we are not well served uh, by um, simplified portrayals of the Supreme Court as simply pol uh, doing politics through another means. Um, I think that greatly simplifies what, what, uh, what the court does. I actually think that the one contribution the Tea Party has made that I sort of like is talking about the Constitution and telling, telling just plain, ordinary people they should read the Constitution and talk about it. And I, So I don't have a problem with the idea that there's constitutional argument going on. The problem I have is just the kind of up, down, yes, no, is it constitutional? Um, on, the, on the question of where the court is going in the public estimation, we live in a hyper-polarized time. In a, in a time that's much more polarized than American politics has been really, I think, probably since the 19th century. I mean, there just isn't that kind of mid-range consensus. And that means that I think all institutions are likely to have higher negative scores than they do in a time where there's more consensus. Because whatever the Supreme Court decides in issues of high salience to lots of people, there are going to be a large number of people who disagree. And if they see the Supreme Court consistently deciding cases in a way they don't like, they're going to think worse of the Supreme Court. So no surprise yeah. in a hyperpolarized time. You know, you make me think yeah. another candidate case, to answer to your question about the most consequential cases of the last one or two or three generations, yeah. another candidate case in my mind would be Roe v. Wade. <clears throat> because it was a, Roe v. Wade was a gift to the Republican right. It allowed them to politicize uh, constituencies that had not been actively politicized, evangelical communities, which before the 70s weren't terribly politically active. In fact, there was a lot of evangelical doctrine about why you should avoid the political arena. Uh, and Roe v. Wade helped uh, Republican mobilizers overcome that. And I think that's the, around the cluster of issues that became known as the social issues, Roe v. Wade and abortion is probably the single most contentious issue in that basket. And it, it changed the political landscape in ways that we're still living with. So it's not so much on stri strictly yeah. judiciary or constitutional grounds that that case is important, but just for the way it, I think, profoundly affected the political culture. And then uh, on your, uh, just to go back to your last point about yep. the kind of the 18 year rotation thing, it'd be easy enough if you had the political will to do it to come up with a statutory fix here, which is just you say, the judge, federal judges all have life tenure, but there's nothing in the Constitution that says life tenure on what court. And so you could theoretically say judges are going to rotate onto the Supreme Court and then ro to rotate back to the Court of Appeals, or like if that was what you were trying to do. Do I think this is a good idea or not? I, I don't really have strong views about it. I actually don't think it would lead to the appointment of younger justices. I think it would lead to the appointment of older justices. That is, right now, a president has every incentive to find the youngest possible person he or she can put on the Supreme Court because that legacy will last a lot longer. Um, if you knew that people were only going to serve 18 years, then why appoint somebody who's 44 to the Supreme Court? Because they'll have to leave when they're 62. Why not appoint somebody who's 55 or 60 if you know they're going to 
uh, you know, because the average justice pretty much stays on the Supreme Court until his or her 70s. Um, and I think that's one of the things that, that you see a lot now is this idea that you should appoint people as young as possible to courts because that way they'll have much more influence. So I would think if the, you had term limits, presidents would be less inclined to look for somebody who was 40 uh, to put on the Supreme Court. I want to shift the topic of conversation to something um, um, that concerns the nominations that presidents get to make and then, then the nomination process. So, uh, Goodwin, one thing you mentioned with respect to the Health Care Act about, you know, worries about it just being an up or down vote from the, you know, a poll, uh, was that these were incredibly complex constitutional arguments that even the most highly skilled advocates and justices um, disagreed about. And one of the things that, of course, is said frequently about the constitution of the current Supreme Court is that it, it's com composed entirely of people who were constitutional lawyers and or former just judges. And there might be something better to be gained if there were people with a diversity of background experiences that reflected something like you know, the diversity of the country. So w when you mention how complicated the interpretation is and how um, difficult it is just as a, as a matter of jurisprudence, does that cut against the view that we should have a more popular representation on the court? And then independent of that, I'm curious what each of you think about that particular argument. The court would be a better institution in some way or another if it wasn't composed entirely of constitutional law professors and former, former judges. Well, I think that, um you know, one of the great virtues of having multi-member courts, uh, I mean, why, why do we have multi-member courts? I mean, it, it must be because we believe that the contributions of many people to the solving of a particular legal problem is better than just giving it over to one or giving it over to a machine, right? So, so we do value diversity in some respect. Uh, so that is an essential premise, I think, of our, of our system. Um, I wouldn't underestimate, though, the degree of, of just simple technical qualification that is necessary uh, for service on a court like the US Supreme Court. I mean, the issues are very complicated. And uh, we only get to see the ones that are really visible, the issues that kind of have a little more you know, social salience and whatnot. But the court decides you know, dozens upon dozens of cases every year that nobody ever hears about. Um, and I can tell you from having read you know, some of those things, you know, you have to have some serious legal chops to get to get to write those things um, and to really understand the issues that are at stake. So I wouldn't minimize the kind of simple professional expertise that's really required for the job. I, I think I'll identify one area where I think there would be a difference, which is I think the current Supreme Court thinks Congress is a bunch of idiots, and they <laughs> act that way. The level of disdain for Congress and the legislative process among the current justices is extensive. Probably the justice who's most respectful of Congress is Justice Breyer, who, no, no coincidence, spent time as chief counsel of the Judiciary Committee for a short period of time. Uh, they, most of the justices, uh, you know, I mean, I'll just give one example because it's so striking to me. Um, at an oral argument about the constitutionality of the extension of the Voting Rights Act of 1965, uh, that was held a, a couple of years ago. Justice Scalia asked one of the lawyers who was arguing the case, what was the vote on the extension? 98 to nothing, wasn't it, in the Senate? And the lawyer said, yes. And 300 and something to 30 something in the Senate, in the House. And the lawyer said, yes. And Justice Scalia said, 98 to nothing. Doesn't that just show that the law is wrong? <laughs> you know, because if Congress could agree on it that way, there must be compromises and papering over and the like. I mean, that's my, that's my gloss on it. Then the Justice Scalia thing was, 98 to nothing, there must be something wrong with the law. Um, you know, and, and I think the court is disdainful of the political process and disdainful of the people who are in the political process. I think they would be less disdainful if they had had more experience with the political process. I'd really like it if somebody on the Supreme Court had spent some extensive period of his or her life defending people accused of crimes. I think maybe a couple of the justices have represented one or two people, probably on appeal, uh, involving sexy legal issues in criminal defense cases, but I don't think they've spent much time uh, defending people. None of them has been a legal services lawyer representing primarily poor 
uh, people, and I think that affects them. I think, you know, Justice O'Connor wrote a very moving tribute to Justice Marshall when he retired from the Supreme Court about his, how his perspective changed how the justices sometimes thought about issues. And if what you have is people who all went to elite law schools and then spent their lives in the federal government and then in the federal judiciary, you're going to have uh, a loss of a certain flavor on the court. So I agree entirely that you need people who have the technical expertise to do law, but there are lots of people who have that technical expertise who've spent their lives doing something other than being federal court of appeals judges. And it would be nice if there was more than one person uh, on the Supreme Court who didn't come straight from a federal court of appeals. You know, I'll just tell you a short, quick story about that. It has to do with Justice uh, O'Connor, <clears throat> who spoke here on campus a few years back in a lecture series, the name of which I forget, but it brings the Rathbun, a the Rathbun yes, series. Yes, exactly. Thank you. Rathbun lectures. Brings accomplished people here to talk about their personal values yeah. and beliefs. And the ground rules for all interactions with students are you can't ask them about their public career. It's supposed to be about their personal lives and personal beliefs and so on. So Justice O'Connor was talking and the student asked the question. And he said, well, I'd like to know how your life experiences affected your ju judicial philosophy. With the questions out of bounds. And I thought she was going to cut him off the knees, which she's perfectly capable of doing. But no, she answered the question in a really interesting way. I thought where she was going to go was I was a legislator in Arizona, and I was politically active, and I brought that experience to the court along the ways you're suggesting. But no. She said, you know, I grew up on this ranch uh, in the old Gadsden Purchase uh, in Arizona. It was really remote. And problems arose every day. And we had to fix the fence, or we had to fix the generator, or fix the pump, or whatever. And we couldn't have somebody come in and do it for us because it was too remote and too far away. So we just had to find solutions every day to these problems on the ranch. And the solutions were often not pretty. And they weren't elegant. But they solved the problem. And that's the philosophy I brought to the court. So let me ask, by the way, we are very aware that you guys have been there for almost three hours because you sat through the debate and this class. So we, I would, we are all very thoughtful of that, and we're going to actually end it and let Goodwin or let us go home to our kids, et cetera. But a couple of questions follow up on Justice O'Connor. You have in front of the court right now that we just had the affirmative action. Justice O'Connor was the swing vote in the affirmative action case. She wrote the, 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 the decision in, in Grutter and Gratz. What do you think the odds are that that will get overturned now that, we've, that we no longer have Justice O'Connor? And what do you think, you brought up Roe v. Wade. What do you think the, oper the chances are that we might have a Roe v. Wade overturned? I will start with you, Pam. OK, so on, on Roe against Wade, on the current court, I see no possibility whatsoever that Roe against Wade itself will be overturned. But uh, I think that the current court is more hospitable to a variety of restrictions and regulations on abortion uh, than the court was at the time of Roe v. Wade. So, you know, informed consent laws, laws banning particular abortion techniques or procedures, laws regulating where abortions can be performed, laws regulating what physicians tell their patients or the like. I think a lot of those kinds of laws uh, would, would be much more likely to be upheld by the current court than by the court that decided Roe or that decided Thornburg against ACOG, which was a kind of high water mark of abortion rights in the 1980s. Uh, and obviously, if you had a change in the membership of the Supreme Court, you could see uh, Roe against Wade being overturned. But far more likely, I, I don't think there are a lot of states that would have an outright criminalization of all abortions, which right. is what you would need to overturn Roe. Instead, what you're likely to see is states pass more restrictive laws, and uh, the Supreme Court upholds them if it becomes more conservative or it strikes, it down, it strikes them down if they become more liberal. On the future of affirmative action, yeah. I don't see uh, a likelihood on the current court that the court will hold that all affirmative action is unconstitutional and, and or forbidden by federal law. Um, but I think this court is more likely to be hospitable to limits on affirmative action. Because here is a place where I think the swap out of Justice Alito for Justice O'Connor is profound. Justice Alito strikes me from a couple of opinions he's written since he's been on the Supreme Court as someone who is unbelievably hostile to affirmative action uh, and to race conscious solutions. Whereas Justice O'Connor was very much a sort of split the baby on the one hand, on the other hand, you can use race, but not too much. And so I think, you know, uh, 
I think the current court is more suspicious of affirmative action than the court was so, when Justice Sotomayor So Tucker you don't there. see that the case that just got argued, the Texas case, as, as with this, because it's this court. It's going to yeah. overturning Grutter and Gratz. Well, just I, maybe, I'll go ahead. I, I, no. think, I mean, I think that there are perhaps four members of the court who are pretty skeptical about any use of race uh, in governmental decision making, and they've made that point of view yeah. fairly clear in, in their opinions. I think the crucial vote is Justice Kennedy. Um, and it's kind of interesting that Justice Kennedy succeeded Justice Powell uh, on, on this particular issue because Justice Powell uh, was the one who wrote uh, the uh, single justice opinion in the Bakke case uh, in 1978, which laid out the modern framework for how affirmative action is supposed to be practiced by universities. And Justice Kennedy has actually not uh, frontally disagreed with Justice Powell's basic idea that educational diversity is a very important, compelling uh, goal and that universities have some leeway to fashion their own aims and to, to gather the students that they want to further those aims. But he has also never met a governmental use of race that he thought passed constitutional muster. Um, at least I, I think that's right. Um, and, and, uh, and so, uh, you know, one possible outcome is that Justice Kennedy will say, well, I, you know, adhere to the Bakke framework, but this policy just doesn't meet it. Um, and through the mechanics of applying these various tests that they apply, will limit and further limit uh, the uses of race uh, while not uh, gutting, you know, the entire enterprise. Good, and I have a last question for you quickly. You're on the California Supreme Court. What's, what's on the docket? What's coming up that we should pay attention to? Oh, we have, um, we have lots of interesting cases. Um, so uh, this is, this is a, a court of general jurisdiction, which means we hear all kinds of issues, both state and federal. Um, one case that we have right now concerns whether or not um, an, an undocumented uh, immigrant uh, can be licensed to practice law in California. This is a guy who passed the bar exam, and uh, the question is whether he can uh, get a law license. Um, it'll be a complex uh, interplay between the federal uh, laws on immigration and the state laws governing who can practice, uh, practice law. That'll be, that'll be f uh, interesting to watch. We have a number of cases um, that, uh, uh, that concern uh, medical marijuana dispensaries. Um, that's a pretty complicated interaction among local laws s that have gone both ways. Some localities have sought to authorize these dispensaries, some have sought to ban them. Layered on top of that are state laws that have their own you know, drug policies, and then layered on top of that is the federal drug laws. So figuring out all of that should be pretty interesting. Um, and then we have a, a panel like this, I think, uh, just in terms of the, the nature of the cases. We have a lot of cases that concern uh, preemption. And uh, one active area is uh, the, uh, this affects a lot of different things, including class actions, including employment law. It, it concerns the scope to, uh, of the Federal Arbitration Act, which the Supreme Court has interpreted more and more expansively over the years uh, to uh, uphold, essentially, um, uh, contracts that require arbitration of, of whatever disputes may arise. You probably signed, you know, I don't know how many contracts that require you to arbitrate just when you got your little iPhones or your iPads or, you know, when every time you buy something from iTunes, every update that you get from your computer, all of those probably have some uh, arbitration agreement in them. Um, and the question is, what's the interaction between that federal policy as interpreted by the Supreme Court and state policies that govern contracts, which is a very bread and butter state law area. Contract law is, by and large, state law. Um, and so this interaction has been a contest between the uh, federal, federal law and the state courts for some time. We have a number of cases in the wake of um, quite expansive Supreme Court precedents that have interpreted the F uh, Federal Arbitration Act that require us to examine um, the contours of our state contract law. Those are just a few. Um, we, have, we have lots of interesting cases. You're going to be busy. <laughs> all right. I want to take a moment and have us all thank Pam and Goodwin for joining us. For more, please visit us at stanford.edu.